forgot to turn my microphone on there. Well, good morning. I am so excited to be with you guys today. Um, in addition to being um, the Karen Counseling Pastor, I'm also Jeff's wife and Evan's mom. Okay, everybody knows Jeff, everybody knows Evan, so I like to point out that connection. Um, and then also, I've been super sick this week, and um, so I've been struggling with my voice and coughing and clearing my throat, and so we're just going to trust that if the Lord wants you to hear the whole message today, that he will give me the voice to share the whole message today. Um, and then finally... I have two drinks because I've been thirsty since 2001. And um, it was super good to know that no one is in the splash zone because I talk with my hands. So we're good to go. Um, let's get started. <clears throat> so I have a tendency to make things more complicated than they really are. And so a few months ago, this light appeared on my dashboard. Does anyone know what this light is? Sure is. I did not know what it meant, so I took a picture of it, texted it to Jeff, and he immediately called me. And he said, Amy, that is your tire pressure light. You need to check your tires. And I was in a hurry. I was leaving here to get to a meeting in Denver. So my heart rate is already going up because I'm going to be late. But then I remembered I had this really cool tire pressure screen on my on-dash computer, kind of looks like this, that shows you the tire pressure in all four tires. Right, really cool screen. So I am pushing buttons and turning dials, frantically trying to get to this screen, and I'm getting every other screen but this one. And so I am losing it. So I quickly turn my voice call with Jeff into a FaceTime call, turn it around, and show him the dashboard while still frantically pushing buttons. Now, he knows exactly what I'm trying to find. He does not need to see it through FaceTime, but I am in a total panic. All right, so he finally says to me, cutie, that's his pet name for me, cutie, park the car, get out, and look at your tires. <laughs> Okay, that solution had not occurred to me. So simple. So now I'm completely embarrassed at my stupidity, but I do get out, I walk around, and I find that my front right tire is completely flat. And so I inform Jeff that this is what's happening, and he can tell that I am at a breaking point because car problems are and always have been in our house what we call DR, dad's responsibility. So he says, you know what, we have roadside assistance, but how about if I just come there and fix it for you? I'll be there in 20 minutes. So I breathe this big sigh of relief. Flat tires are an everyday occurrence in our world. And the solution, either call AAA or get out your jack and spare, are also everyday solutions. But I made it complicated and arguably pretty dramatic, which is my way. But see, we as humans have this tendency to make things complicated. It's called the complexity bias. Because when we're faced with a challenge, the simple solution doesn't seem as credible. So we look for solutions that are more complex. And sometimes that means we miss what's right in front of us. Do you make things harder than they need to be? Maybe because the easy option just seems too good to be true? I think we do that with God's love all the time. I think we struggle with the idea of his unconditional love. So last week, I had the honor of teaching the baptism class with Luke. Just a minute. And I was pierced by the simple truth spoken by one of the children. Her name is Evie, and she wrote the word love on her shirt. And when Mike asked her why she chose the word love, she said, we sin and God will always love us. We sin and God loves us. Can it really be that simple? So today I want to share the incredible story of Rahab the prostitute. And if you want to know the end of the story, she sinned and God loved her. But how do we get from here to there? 
This is actually the final message in our series on Hebrews 11, affectionately known as the Hall of Faith, and we have renamed it the Hall of Flaws. And so the author of Hebrews was concerned that the faith of those early Hebrew Christians was starting to wane because they were being persecuted for their beliefs. And so Hebrews 11 was probably written as a sermon to them. And he reminds them of all of these Old Testament stories of faith amidst adversity. And it's a smart call. They know these stories. They've heard these stories again and again. And people relate to stories. If I'm trying to illustrate an important idea, I'm going to anchor it in something or someone that you can relate to, like my flat tire story. So the author of Hebrews decides to remind them of these Old Testament stories of faith, not only as examples of faith, but nearly impossible stories of faith. And so he's trying to say, if these Old Testament characters can have faith amidst impossible odds, suffering and trouble, we can too. So let's talk about Rahab. She gets one sentence included in the Hall of Faith. Verse 31 on your screen. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. I actually like the way the New King James Version writes it. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So let's see why her story was so special. It's actually found in the book of Joshua. And so anyone who has attended any of my workshops ever knows that I love stories so much that I always include a story time with Dr. Amy Element to them. So let's do this story today. If you have your Bible, Joshua is in the Old Testament. It's near the beginning. It's actually the sixth book right after Deuteronomy. <clears throat> And at this point, Moses has died, and Joshua has taken over the reins of leading the Israelites. And they are taking back Canaan, the land that was promised to them by God. And the city of Jericho is going to be their first stop. Uh, Jericho is a fortified city with an upper wall and a lower wall, and we believe that Rahab lived either in or against that lower wall. All right, here's a map of where they are right now. Incidentally, I show you a map because my husband believes that maps are essential to every story. And he will not even start studying or digging into a story without knowing the exact location. His Bible is this fat because it's the one that's full of maps. And ironically, he's in Montana on his annual epic fly fishing trip and does not even get to see my nod to his love of maps. It is so sad. <laughs> All right, so the red lines are the routes that the Israelites are going to take to conquer the entire region of Canaan, but currently they're in that lower right corner in Shittim. And so first they have to travel west across the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea, and then they'll reach Jericho. And Jericho is actually blocking the routes uh, to both the central and southern regions. So they have to do that first or they won't get to the other cities. All right, so let's start in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. All right, so Joshua hears directly from the Lord that it's time to take back the land and that God promises to be with him through it all. And this is really important because we are going to see God's hand all over the story. So let's jump ahead to chapter 2, verse 1. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. All right, we are not going to ask why they went to a prostitute's house. We're just not. Like, we're going to concede right now as a group that there was a good but unwritten reason. God orchestrates meetings 
Doesn't he? I bet you can think of a time where you met someone and walked away saying, that was a God thing. I have lots of stories like that. Several of my really good friends, I feel, were orchestrated by God through a meeting. But orchestrating a meeting with a prostitute seems super uncharacteristic of God. So it was a strange meeting indeed. And she's not just a prostitute, she's a Canaanite prostitute, which is like sin on top of sin on top of sin. But let's see what God does with it. Verse 2. But someone tells the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come to your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. Actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. All right, so when I read this passage, I have two fundamental questions. First, how did Rahab know to hide the spies before the king's men show up? So let's just assume they were on the roof and she could see them coming. The entire town of Jericho was estimated to be about nine acres. That is the size of about two Walmart super centers side by side. So if they were already on the roof, maybe she could have seen them coming down the road. So we're going to just go with that. But my second question is why would Rahab take such a risk? Lying to the king would be an act of treason punishable by death. So why would she risk her life for complete strangers? All right, let's keep going. Verse 7. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up onto the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. So Rahab is in a unique position as a prostitute in a town that is only the size of two Walmart super centers. So she has probably heard from lots of men. She's heard their stories, their secrets, their fears. She may have even overheard conversations in between them. And so these things that she's mentioning, the parting of the Red Sea and destroying the Amorite kings and their people, that happened about 42 years prior. So that is plenty of time for these stories to spread through Canaan and stir up this intense fear of the Israelites. But listen to what she says next. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. Did she just proclaim the sovereignty of our God? It sure seems like it. She's never seen him. She's only heard about what he's done. But she declares that he is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. I think that's the definition of faith. So let's look at how the author of Hebrews defined faith for us in the beginning. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So assurance is a state of mind of being without a doubt. And so she sure sounds like she has no doubts about the power and sovereignty of God. But does she have that element of hope that the author of Hebrews includes in that definition? So hold on to that question and we will see. Returning to the story of Joshua chapter 2, verse 12, Rahab says to the spies, Now swear to me by the Lord you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my mother, father, brothers, sisters, and all their families. We offer our own lives as guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then, since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. 
Escape to the hill country, she told them. <clears throat> Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then, when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, we will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave the scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. All your family members must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside this house, we will accept responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. I accept your terms, she replied. She sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. So for years, I was skeptical of Rahab's motivation and even more intrigued by her inclusion in the Hall of Faith. After all, don't you think her faith was just fire insurance? The realization that the God of the Israelites is going to wipe us out so I better be on his side of the fight, that's fire insurance. And she's a savvy negotiator, a shrewd businesswoman who saw a chance to save herself and she took it. What did she really have to lose by asking the spies to save her? She was going to be killed with the rest of her city anyway. But something has turned and softened my heart toward Rahab and her intentions. First, I decided that maybe she's different from the evil Canaanites. I doubt that she awakened one day and said, my dream is to be a prostitute in a pagan land. No, surely circumstances dictated that choice. See, the Canaanites were corrupt and doing some pretty horrendous things. They were living in sin that had reached the point of no return. They were known to making, they were known for making human sacrifices to their gods, including sacrificing babies. They were known for having sex in the temple to make lands more fertile. And a second kind of prostitute called a sacred or temple prostitute was forced to have sex with worshipers of these gods and goddesses in the temple. So some theologians believe that Canaanite children were sold into slavery to become these temple prostitutes and suggest that maybe Rahab could have been one of those. Children sold into slavery and made into a temple prostitute. But then when she was no longer useful or had aged out of that profession, maybe the only way she could support herself was to hang a sign on her door and open her own prostitution business, the only trade she knew. If that was her story or some version of her story, I wonder how many times she hoped for a different life, a better life, hoped of being a wife or a mother, but buried in the shame of her profession, thinking her story had been written for her and the ending wasn't changeable. And as the stories had said over the years about the Israelites' God, our God, I wonder if she yearned for his love, hoping to be rescued even. And so what looked like a negotiated business transaction to me might actually have been an answered prayer that she didn't even know how to ask until that very moment. Or maybe her shame had been so great that she deemed herself unworthy. Or maybe she was the sole believer in an evil land and didn't want to risk her life until the moment her life depended on it. This moment? All right, so the spies agree to her terms, but she still has work to do. She has to convince her entire family that the Israelites' God is going to save all of them if and only if they gather and stay in her house while the entire city is destroyed around them. That is a conversation I would love to hear. Meanwhile, the spies do what she says to do. They hide out in the hills for three days before returning to report back to Joshua, who is still waiting with the rest of the Israelites on the other side of the Jordan River. So here's what they tell him. Verse 24, the Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. So Joshua has the information he needs, and the Lord gives him instructions on how to take the city, beginning by marching around it 
every day for seven days, and on the seventh day, march around it seven times. They're going to blow their ram's horns. They're going to shout. The walls are going to fall down, and the Israelites are going to march in and take the city. And as this happens, Joshua says to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all her family. So the men who had been spies went in, brought out Rahab, her father, mother, brothers, and all the relatives who were there with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. And then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. All right. This entire fall of Jericho, this scene, this is the stuff that movies are made of. It is so interesting. I encourage you to go back and read the entire thing. But I have to just say one part that's crazy. All right, let's assume that about 40,000 Israelites storm the city that's only the size of two Walmart super centers. 40,000 men. There are about 1,200 people, Canaanites, living in the upper city. All right, so we're talking about 40,000, 101,000, and 200 people all on top of each other. Okay, the fire capacity of a Walmart super center is about 4,500 people. So if we, I looked it up. So you put 10 times that amount of people in two Walmart super centers, it had to be chaos. Chaos. They had to be falling all over each other. So these two spies managed to get all the way across this crowd to Rahab's house and get her family, pull them back through this chaos and crowd without someone accidentally slaughtering one of them in the mayhem. God is so good. Remember how I mentioned that Rahab's circumstances probably had dictated her profession? But after the fall of Jericho, Rahab's circumstances had changed, and she had a choice to make. She could stay with the Israelites, leave behind her people, her culture, her religion, everything that she knew, or she could go off into the wilderness and set up shop somewhere else and figure it out. But we know she chose to stay with the Israelites. We don't hear about Rahab again, though, in the Old Testament. The next time she's mentioned is in the very beginning of the New Testament. In that section that we all tend to skip over because it's long and it gets in the weeds and we can't pronounce half the names, we just want to get to the good news. But it's actually Matthew 1, verse 1. This is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. And it starts with Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. So not only did Rahab make the decision to stay with the Israelites, she married one of them. She got married to Solomon, and they had Boaz. Boaz, who was the guardian redeemer of Ruth, he's one of the godliest men in the Old Testament, and Rahab raised him. She was his mom. And then Boaz and Ruth have Obed, who's, King's da who's King David's grandfather. That makes Rahab the great-great-grandmother of King David. And if that isn't cool enough, look what God does. He makes her the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great 32-great-grandmother of another king, Jesus the Messiah. God rewrote her story. When we were deciding as a team which character we wanted to preach about, I picked Rahab. And I was excited to teach on Rahab until I started planning my message on Rahab, the prostitute. Because that label carries so much shame. And shame stirs up emotions 
that frankly, I'd just rather not bring up. But I wonder how long it took her to shed that label. Rahab is mentioned eight times in the Bible, and five of those times she's called Rahab the prostitute. The Israelites that she stayed with, they knew what her profession had been. They knew her story. They knew what she had done for a living and the shameful life she had lived. So I wonder how long her past defined her. What if we were all permanently labeled according to our past mistakes and sins? Alex the addict, Derek the drunk, Susan the shoplifter. When I first gave my life to Jesus, I stayed on the fringes of faith. One foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. And that is a really hard fence to straddle. I called myself a Christian, but I didn't feel worthy of being in the inner circle because they might find out I used to drink too much. They might find out that I had been divorced. They might find out all of the things that I was a fraud and not a good Christian girl. They would think I don't have a spot at God's table. Heck, I didn't think I had a spot at God's table. Man, was I missing it. Beth Moore, in her study, Breaking Free, said, if there was a pit, I jumped in it. When I heard that, I said, she read my mail. She wrote my life story in one sentence. If there was a pit, I jumped in it. You know what's in that pit with us? Shame. You know the hardest thing about being in the pit? how dark it is. Shame loves the dark. The enemy loves the dark. Shame loves the dark so much it sets up house in that pit, making it more comfortable down there than up here in the light. And when we try to pull ourselves out of a pit without the love and grace of God, here's what happens. We either live in a never-ending spiral of shame or we participate in this epidemic of perfectionism. And anything that falls short must be unworthy. We have to clean ourselves up before we're worthy of love. I'm an Enneagram three. Any other threes in the room? No other threes in the room. Okay, threes are the achievers. But I am a classic overachiever. I hide, I hide behind my achievements so no one can see my flaws. I don't have hobbies, just achievements. Free time, I'll go achieve something. Feeling down about myself for gaining some weight, mm, I better go achieve something. Did someone suggest I should have done something differently? Whoa, kryptonite. I better go achieve something. It's like a drug. Actually, it's worse than a drug, it's an idol. And that chronic pursuit of perfection is idol worship. My therapist once asked me, when will you know you have achieved enough to be enough? We make things so complicated. Brene Brown is a vulnerability and shame researcher. In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, she writes, perfectionism is a self-destructive and addictive belief system that fuels this primary thought. If I look perfect, live perfect, work perfect, and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize the painful feelings of shame, judgment, and blame. Why is it self-destructive? Because perfection is an unattainable goal. The more we try, the more we fail, and that just perpetuates all of those feelings that we're trying to avoid in the first place. It's absurd, yet we do it anyway. Maybe you have or had parents who conditioned their love for you on performance, but that's not our God. Maybe your Instagram feed has been hijacked by an algorithm of Perfect moms or perfect dads, perfect athletes, perfect homes, perfect wardrobes, perfect children. But that is not what our God is asking us to be or do. He's just asking us to have faith in him 
and let him do the rest. Henri Nouwen, in his book, Life of the Beloved, wrote, there is that voice, that voice that speaks from above and from within and that whispers softly or declares loudly, you are my beloved, on you my favor rests. It is certainly not easy to hear that voice in a world filled with voices that shout, you are no good, you are ugly, you are worthless, you are despicable, you are nobody, unless you can demonstrate the opposite. He goes on to write, Becoming the beloved is pulling the truth revealed to me from above down into that ordinariness of what I am, in fact, thinking of, talking about, and doing from hour to hour. That truth, we are his beloved. Why do we make it so complicated? Maybe this message doesn't resonate with you. Maybe you followed Jesus all or most of your life and you've done a pretty good job staying out of the pit. My challenge to you then is to think of someone who might be in a pit or has spent time in a pit so dark you could never imagine yourself there. Do you love them the way God loves them? Do you see them as his beloved? Do you look at them and say, that's Joe, the drug addict, but he finally found Jesus and got his act together? Or do you look at Joe and say, Joe really struggled until he found Jesus. I am so happy he knows what it likes, what it means to be a child of God. I've wondered what it took for Solomon to look at Rahab like that. Did he see her and say, she is a hot mess and needs a little God in her life? Or did he say, wow. That is a woman who risked her life for my friends and risked her life to follow our God. That's someone I want to know. I was watching a sermon recording of Stephen Furtick from Elevation Church. He was relaying a story of asking his kids who they would ask to see first when they got to heaven. He said the line to see Jesus first would be way too long. So while they were waiting, who would they ask to talk to next? Moses? Abraham? He said, I bet nobody would be brave enough to ask to see Rahab, the prostitute. But let's just say they were. What would that conversation look like? You go up to St. Peter at the pearly gates and say, hey, would it be possible for me to talk to Rahab, the prostitute? And St. Peter checks his list and says, no, I don't see anyone by that name here. We've got a Rahab, but there's no Rahab the prostitute. See, when Rahab said yes to God, he rewrote her story. She was Rahab the wife, Rahab the mother, Rahab the great-great-grandmother of a king, David, and Rahab the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-32 great-grandmother of the king, Jesus. In these characters we've been talking about for the last 12 weeks, we've seen lots of flaws. Mike preached that what we see as weakness, God sees as opportunity. And Christy preached that even broken trees bear fruit. If God can use a Canaanite prostitute to accomplish his work, he can use anyone. Why would he use a prostitute? Why would he not? It's not complicated. See, we are all weak. We are all broken. If God waited around for us to be not weak and not broken, he'd never be able to use us in the kingdom. It is the plight of being human, our brokenness. As I was reading Henri Nouwen's book, Life of the Beloved, I was struck for the very first time by the two words in the word, beloved. Beloved. Be loved. I picture in our brokenness, our conversations with God being something like this. But God, what about all my flaws? And him saying, beloved, be loved. But God, what about my addiction? Beloved, be loved. But, but God, what about my divorce? Beloved. 
be loved. But what about that time I hurt my friend by telling her, beloved, be loved. But what about that time, beloved, be loved. We make things complicated. It's really simple though. We sin and God loves us. And as the Holy Spirit works on us and works on our hearts and sanctifies us, we can only pray that someday we can love a little like that too. That we can love others the way God does. That we can allow ourselves to be loved the way God loves us. Trayvon and the music team, you guys can come back up. The Apostle John writes, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is the good news. Jesus paid the price on the cross for all our sins, not just the small sins, all the sins. For God so loved the world, not just the good part of the world, the world, the sins of our past, the sins of our future, bought and paid for. We sin and God loves us. So where did this land with you today? What do you do with all of this? If you feel something stirring in your heart right now, it might be the Holy Spirit trying to nudge you to take care of something that you need to take care of or take care of someone that you need to take care of or take care of yourself. Hey, it's okay if you are in a place that you don't believe anything I said and that is okay. Mike reminds us that you can belong before you believe. But if this resonates with you, if you want to dig in, we're starting our Alpha course here in a couple of weeks. That's a great way to get started. Or you can reach out to one of us. Talk to me. Talk to Chandice. Talk to Mike or Christy or Trayvon or Amelia. We'll be happy to have a conversation with you about what it looks like to be all in loved as a follower of Jesus or what it looks like to just get started. It's not complicated. Beloved, be loved. We're going to respond with some worship. Prayer team, if you would make yourselves available up front, you can move around, take something to the cross. We have communion elements over there as well.